Her Majesty uh, was the constitutional sovereign of a polity from which the United States had broken free in 1776, but also by which the American nation in embryo had been nurtured for two centuries before. And among the many acts of affection and regard which Elizabeth II showed to America, um, and they included, for example, her personal love of horse racing, which led her to Kentucky on uh, many private visits. Um, but Americans will perhaps best recall her ordering the Guards military band outside Buckingham Palace to play the Star Spangled Banner on the morning of September the 12th, 2001. Moreover, national cons conservatism, to which we're devoted here, includes a respect for different national traditions and different constitutional settlements. We each tend to favor our own, which is right and proper, but there are times when we can recognize with gratitude that another tradition has its advantages and has thrown up a splendid representative. Uh, while we've been holding these marvelous discussions in the last two days, a kind of theater, constitutional theater, has been playing out in Britain. It has two um, contrasting competing parts. Uh, first one is that, perhaps the second one is the, um, the, the, the arrival of the new king constitutionally to take up all his duties, his uh, presentation to the peoples of Scotland, Northern Ireland as well, and, uh, and Wales, before he, uh, he does so in London, the splendid occasion in Westminster Hall, uh, in which his, um, for the formal presentation of his kingship was made. And all of these have been conducted with all the ceremonial splendor uh, and efficiency of the British on these occasions. The second, or the first, has been the sight of the Queen's coffin being carried along in a hearse, first to Edinburgh, where it lay in state, and then uh, to, uh, to, um, uh, to London. Um, as the hearse has gone along, large, huge, silent crowds have been lining the roadsides. Uh, they have, people have been queuing and will queue for long hours through the night in order to be able to attend her lying in state. That's happened in Scotland now. Lying in state is a somber occasion. It is not particularly colorful, but it marks, but it has been the most important of these two events in the last few days because of the extraordinary public reception that the Queen has received from her, from her former subjects. <clears throat> if a constitutional monarchy has an advantage over other national systems and symbols, it is that it's personal. Um, that's a disadvantage too if you have kings like Charles II and Edward VIII. But as the extraordinary silent crowds lining the streets reveal, almost all her subjects have felt her death as a personal loss. That's not too surprising. She has been the sovereign for the entire life of anyone under the age of 70. It's said that the number of her British subjects she met in her reign amounted to about a third of the present UK population. It sounds unlikely. Um, but not impossible. I myself met the Queen twice. Once when she visited the offices of the Daily Telegraph in the year of her Silver Jubilee, another time when I received a decoration from her after serving in government. Uh, we exchanged two sentences. Uh, what does political services mean in your case, Mr. O'Sullivan, she asked. Uh, I used to work, I said, for the previous Prime Minister. Um, she probably kept you pretty busy, the Queen replied. I said, very hectic, ma'am. 
At that, as I had been warned, uh, the Queen signified that the interview was over. <laughs> How did she signify this? Blessed if I know, but she did. And I did know, bowed and returned to my appointed seat. My experience of this was repeated, obviously, with many other Brits, many, many times. Reigning for 70 years, dealing with 15 prime ministers, um, dealing with 14 US presidents, uh, helping them to negotiate crises from the Suez affair to the COVID-19 pandemic to Grenada, she almost never put a foot wrong. And on the rare occasions when she might have put a foot wrong, as in the Commonwealth crisis over Rhodesia, she left no footprint. There was skill and prudence as well as virtue behind that record. She was careful to deal with all the state papers that arrived in red boxes day after day after day. She was famous for never neglecting them, for getting everything done. The single most important, she was careful, of course, to observe the limits on her power and influence that the status of constitutional monarch imposed on her. The single most important instance of such restraint is that she should avoid making politically controversial statements. Necessary in itself to ensure fairness between the parties, that rule also protects the ability of the monarch to act as a constitutional empire when a major political row threatens conflict or irresolvable instability. There have been many crises during the 70 years of her reign. But we don't know of one that really threatened the Constitution. She never had to call the parties together in Buckingham Palace to resolve a deadlock between them, as her grandfather had done in 1931. Um, she, um, and, and the advice she gave, and the absence of a constitutional crisis is not, cannot be attributed to her influence alone, obviously. Others deserve credit for that too. But the fact is that all of the figures with whom she dealt, every single prime minister, testified to the common sense, realism, and wisdom of that advice. They frequently said they genuinely enjoyed the conversations. Now, it's understandable that in the current atmosphere of sad mourning, um, people should say that. But I do not believe, even in those circumstances, a unanimous verdict of 16 prime ministers can be, ne can be neglected. Now, of course, everybody, partly because of the crown, remembers the vow she made in 1946, a vow to devote her, her life, however long or short it might be, um, to the service of the great imperial uh, family to which we all belong. And she kept that vow as diligently and as dutifully as she kept her vow to the British people. At the time of her death, she was the head of state of 14 other realms, 14 other countries, including Australia, New Zealand, and Canada, but also 11 other countries, such as Grenada in the West Indies. She was also head of the Commonwealth, um, an organization which had started as a former British colonies, but today has grown to 54 member states, four of which had applied, have applied and been accepted as members, even though they never had uh, any, they never, um, had t they never were um, British colonies. She took all those revolution, all those duties very seriously, again, receiving all the red boxes containing all the state papers, giving advice to 15 different prime ministers uh, whenever the crisis involving them arose. Uh, in the course, but it wasn't only an official set of relationships. In the course of uh, her, her time in, in, in office and in the course of these duties, she visited Commonwealth countries on official tours more than 200 times. She's estimated 
to have a conservative estimate is that she met 630,000 people on these visits. She is estimated also to have possibly shaken more hands than any other person in history. Now, she made one decision in the late 60s, early 70s, which she might later have had, I'm sure she must have had at time, uh, occasion to regret. This was, she felt that she had to modernize the monarchy to the extent of opening it up so that people could understand uh, her, she and her, her and her family together. Um, it, obviously, um, the, that, that has produced, or did produce, um, uh, I'm sorry, obviously that did produce uh, some uh, problems as uh, the royal family had its own series of breakups, uh, deaths, scandals, and um, uh, managers that went wrong. Uh, there were, uh, she was defying the argument of a famous constitutional theorist, Walter Badgett, who'd said you really couldn't open up the monarchy and expect it to survive because you can't let daylight in upon magic. Well, yes, there were those scandals. Um, but the truth of the matter is that with each crisis, um, she seemed to grow in strength uh, and in um, subtlety. Um, just as she never left a footprint in politics, so she perfected the art of conveying more than she seemed to say. As for instance, on COVID, where she gave a public talk that calmed public anxieties without arousing controversies in a way that all of the Whitehall scientists had been unable to do. Her subjects felt simply comforted in a way that no one else had been able to comfort them. She ended that broadcast with a reference to the Second World War famous song, We Will Meet Again. On the first official royal visit to um, the Republic of Ireland since the 1920s, she appeared at a garden of remembrance, expressed regret uh, for those who had fallen in the troubles, spoke in Gaelic, um, said she wished that things could have been done differently or not at all, and provoked a surge of warmth and gratitude from ordinary Irish people for removing the hint of disapproval that had hovered over Anglo-Irish friendships, public and private, for so long. After Harry and Meghan's tell all and more, um, television interview, she issued a statement that included the words, recollections may vary. <laughs> more deaths, more, uh, more funerals, more scandals in succession until the funeral of her husband, at which we saw her grieving alone in black. Grief is the price we pay for love, she said, and resumed her official duties. In short, she let daylight in upon magic, but the magic didn't vanish, because it wasn't magic, or at least not only magic. It was wisdom, balance, and the accumulated experience of carrying out official and diplomatic duties in 16 different realms and across the world, and never playing herself or us, false. When lesser public figures were unable to mention God, she did so unaffectedly as the head of a Christian church in her Easter and Christmas messages, speaking, um, speaking to the hearts of her many religious subjects of other faiths because she had certainty and f trust in her own beliefs. She represented us in so many ways and she did so brilliantly. But she wasn't representative of us. She was, in truth, better than us, reminding us of what we once were and perhaps 
could be again if we followed her pattern. Having fulfilled the vow she made, she has finally laid aside her burden of duty. She now goes to the God whom she served so well for so long. I don't think it's presumptuous of me to believe that she has already heard the words, well done, 